So you guys don't know who I am, uh, and that's okay, right? I don't know who you are either, but we'll get through it together, you know? Uh, my name's Joel, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself, but first we're going to slow down, and we're going to uh, read the entire chapter of Daniel 3. Uh, the entire chapter, we'll slow down, work our way through it. There's some chapters of the Bible where this could be... Um, you know, I'm starting to be a pastor, so I think I can say this. It would be a brutal experience to just sit, gather, and read the entire chapter. This is not one of those times. This is an exciting chapter. So uh, I'll do my best to read it lively for us, but I don't think we'll have uh, any issues. So uh, I'm starting to hear in verse 1 of chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, he's the king of Babylon, made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, made it through it. That one was a struggle, but we got through it. Uh, all people must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. 
He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the province, in the province of Babylon. Whoa, all right. Uh, my name's Joel. Yeah. And uh, as Jen said, I'm a vicar. My name is not Victor. Uh, that's a common misconception. If you call me Victor, I'll reply, but my name's Joel. Uh, and what a vicar is, basically, is just an intern pastor. So I'm studying to be a pastor. And for a year, I have an internship with Christ Greenfield Lutheran Church in Gilbert. Uh, I think they give us the term vicar, the seminary gives us a vicar, I don't know, make people feel better, make guys like me feel better, you know, grown man as an intern, that's okay, we're good. Uh, <laughs> but I'm very excited to be here with you guys this morning, talking about the exciting story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's such an awesome Old Testament story that can teach us so much about who God is, who this God we worship is, especially in Jesus. So, no fluff, we're just going to jump right into the story. There's these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, some of you have maybe heard of them, but if you haven't, it's okay. We're all getting on the same page here. These are three Israelite Jews. They're from the nation of Israel. And in about 600 BC, Babylon came and took Israel into exile. And when they did that, they picked out the best and brightest men of all of Israel, taught them the Babylonian language, and trained them up to be of service to King Nebuchadnezzar in his temple. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which, as an aside, are not their Jewish names. Their names were changed as a part of the exile. These three guys, and along with Daniel, the guy who the, the book is named after, are four of the best and brightest of Israel. They're part of this group that has been brought up to serve Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar in his temple. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are under immense pressure to forsake their Jewish identity. Uh, one, they're living under a foreign power. That's enough to do it right there. But two, uh, they've lost their names. Their names are changed. Three, uh, earlier in the first couple chapters, they're pressured to eat the royal uh, non-Jewish diet that's served in the temple. Uh, four, their language, they speak a different language now. This language that they're learning is different from theirs. And now, they're commanded to worship a 90-foot gold Babylonian idol under the threat of death. Uh, these guys are up against it, you know? It, it would be easy for them to look around and think that our God has forgotten us. But God is really with them. Despite the circumstances they find themselves in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are faithful to their God. And word gets to King Nebuchadnezzar that these dudes, they're not bowing down. And he is enraged. Uh, and he brings them in and he says, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you into the furnace to be burned alive. And he says at the end of verse 15, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they're, I kind of like these guys. They're like a little bit smart, you know, with the, but uh, that was a joke, guys. I mean, it's all right. We'll loosen up. We're all good. We're new in here. It's okay. Uh, they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into this blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. They say, you want to know who will save us from your hand, Nebuchadnezzar? Our God will save us. And even if he doesn't, we will never bow before that idol. So as tyrants do, Nebuchadnezzar flies off the handle, and he orders uh, that the furnace be turned up seven times hotter. The furnace is so hot that the guys who are in charge of throwing people into the furnace, it's already a job that I wouldn't want, uh, it gets worse. They're dying because it's so hot, right? And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has his strongest soldiers tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were faithful to their God under life-threatening circumstances, and the worst thing possible happened. Nebuchadnezzar was not bluffing. Uh, He sentenced them to death, uh, and he delivers that death blow. But God is really with them. I don't know about you guys, but I have never been uh, commanded to worship a 90-foot gold Babylonian idol under the threat of death. I would guess that you haven't either. Uh, But there are times in my life where I feel like I'm living life as an exile. And if I feel that way, I'm guessing I'm not the only one. I would guess that there are people in here who feel like we're living under a foreign power. Uh, I see uh, evil run rampant in our world on a broad scale, and I also feel the effects of sin in my own life, in the chafing of my own relationships, in the brokenness of my relationships. And I see a creation stressed under the oppression of this foreign power. I see hurricanes on the East Coast and in the Bahamas, and I see uh, uh, wildfires much, much closer to here. Uh, Sometimes it does not feel like we are living at home. Feels like we're living under a foreign power, under a tyrant. Feels like we're living under the tyranny of sin. But God is really with us. Amidst the difficult circumstances in life, we can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and uh, feel immense pressure to forsake our Christian identities. It can be difficult to remain faithful when we feel how much sin has infected our world and our lives. It can be difficult to trust that God is really with us uh, when we look around and we see suffering and pain and death. A lot of times, it feels like we are facing down a fiery furnace. I'm a relatively new vicar. I haven't been at this for uh, even two months, less than two months I've been doing this. Uh, But I've already found that one of the favorite things I get to do as a vicar, as an intern, is I get to go and visit people in their homes and talk with them and hear their stories and get to know them when they're in the midst of immense suffering. So a couple weeks into this internship, I, uh, I went and visited a guy named Jim from church in Gilbert. Uh, and Jim had been diagnosed with cancer and he was in hospice care. And he shared with me the most amazing stories of his times working on the government planes Uh, He said that he was the guy to talk to about the type of plane that was used in the movie Top Gun. You guys know Top Gun with Tom Cruise, all that? Okay, all right, a little interaction's cool. We're we're fine with that. Um, But yeah, he's the guy. Anybody needs to know about this type of plane, uh, uh, he's the guy to talk to. The president, he needs to know, he calls Jim. Jim is the guy, and he told me a story about how he actually uh, like consulted for the movie, kind of, because he knows all there is to know about this plane. 
and he told me a story about one day how they were uh, filming this crazy scene and they almost killed Tom Cruise. <laughs> what, what, that would be horrible, right? Uh, but Jim, he was an amazing guy. Uh, he uh, was faithful to God. He was a God-fearing man and he was faithful to Jesus even under the threat of death. But the tyranny of sin, the tyrant of sin, was not bluffing. The tyrant of sin delivered its death blow. Jim died earlier this month. But God is really with Jim. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they suffered the worst that King Nebuchadnezzar could give them but they were not abandoned and they were not forgotten. God was really with them. Uh, When they're tossed into the fiery furnace, Daniel writes in, starting in verse 24, he says that King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and then asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. Uh, He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar sees them, but they are not alone. God is really with them. Uh, They were sentenced to death, but God got into the furnace with them. He got into death itself with them. And because they suffered the death sentence of King Nebuchadnezzar, with God, they walked out of the furnace unharmed and unscathed. God was really with them. My friend Jim suffered the worst that the tyrant of sin could give him. But he was not abandoned and he is not forgotten. God is really with him. God got into the grave with Jim. God suffered death with Jim. And because uh, Jim has suffered death with Jesus, he, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, will walk out of the grave unscathed. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Romans, he says it like this, For if we have been united with Jesus in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with Jesus in a resurrection like his. A lot of times, it feels like the tyrant of sin is winning. It feels like death is winning. And like King Nebuchadnezzar, sin will put us all through suffering and eventually sentence us to death. But God is really with us. God has come in Jesus and gotten into the grave with us. He has died the same death that we die. He is in the furnaces of our lives. But you see, the tyrant of sin cannot overpower Jesus. He burst the grave open from the inside and he has walked out unscathed. And because Jesus walked out of the grave, we will too. God is really with us. As we get closer to kind of closing up here, I have a couple thoughts about what it looks like to live life here in the meantime, uh, to live life in the furnace, so to say. I find it immensely comforting that when King Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and he sees uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego along with the fourth guy, uh, he describes them as uh, walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed. They're not scrambling around trying to find a way out. They're not banging on the walls, yelling out. They're just walking around. They have God with them, and that is enough to be at peace, even in the furnace. They have God with them, and that's enough to be at peace, even in the furnace. That's my prayer for us, that we would feel the peace that comes from having God with us even in the difficult circumstances of our lives. Now, I'm not entirely sure what exactly that looks like for all of you because uh, I don't know you. I'm not your pastor. I don't know your struggles. I don't know uh, the difficult circumstances that you guys are living in. 
but I can talk generally about three things that I see people struggle with and that I struggle with myself that can rob us of this peace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. And I can talk about how we can grow to be at peace knowing that God is with us. So the first thing is that it's hard to be at peace when you or somebody you love is suffering in the same way that my friend Jim was. How can we be at peace when we're staring down a fiery furnace, when we're staring down death? Uh, I think we can grow to be at peace in this circumstance uh, when we steep ourselves in the promises of God. So let me explain what I mean by that a little bit. Uh, uh, Steeping yourself in the promise of God might look like reading your Bible daily with an eye towards the faithfulness of our God to keep his promises to his people. Uh, It might look like uh, daily telling yourself the story of Jesus and how the story is not yet over, that he is coming, we know the end, and he will set all things right and make everything new, including you and me. It might look like uh, waking up in the morning and telling yourself that God is with you. The second thing uh, that can rob us of our peace is this. Maybe we look around and we feel like an exile in our world when we see all of the injustice happening around us, all the injustice that has infected our world. Living life at peace in this circumstance might look like praying that Jesus would come quickly to establish his justice for the victimized in our world. And it might look like letting go of anger. It might look like letting go of anger at injustice because we know we can trust that Jesus is coming and his justice that he brings will be better than whatever justice that you or I could think of. It might look like praying for Jesus to come. And it might look like looking for ways that you can uh, take part in this justice that Jesus is establishing in our time and in our place. It might look like looking for opportunities to set things right, not out of anger, but out of love and a desire for peace. Finally, the third thing I think that we might struggle with uh, that robs us of our peace is the thought that there just might not be enough. We look around and we see uh, the ravages of sin in our world and we're worried that we might not be taken care of. Uh, What if I don't have enough to retire? What if I don't have enough to experience all I want to experience or do all I want to do? What if I don't have enough to have the fulfilled life that I want to have? And this scarcity mindset, it, it robs us of our peace. If that's us, if that's our struggle today, then living life with peace, growing to be at peace in that struggle, might look like reminding ourselves who our God is, how generous of a giver our God is to us, especially in Jesus. It might look like reading the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 24 to 34, I think. Yeah, 25 to 34. Uh, where he says, uh, look at the birds. They're taken care of. How much more loved are you than some birds? Uh, Look at the flowers. God's taking care of the flowers. You are way more valuable than flowers. Living life with peace in the midst of a nagging scarcity mindset looks like reminding ourselves of how good and generous and open-handed our Father is to us that he delights in giving good gifts to us. He loves us, and he would never withhold anything from us that we really need. When we grow in our relationship with our generous, generous God, we can learn to be at peace. We can uh, grow to be at peace, even when it looks like to our eyes there might not be enough. That's my prayer for us that we would feel the peace that comes from God with us, that even in the furnaces, the difficult circumstances of our lives, we would feel the peace of God because God is with us. 
And now may this peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.